Well, since the first lesson in Colossians, I knew this day was coming pretty quickly because it's a very short book, four chapters, but it is a book uh, filled with profound theology. Of course, every book is, but the center theme of this book is what theologians would call Christology, the study of Christ, and we have magnificent statements on his deity and humanity and the work that he has accomplished for us and the sufficiency of it all for us. Don't need anything in addition to what he has done. We simply receive it through faith. Uh, what a blessing. So we now come to the end of it with verses uh, 7 through 18 of chapter 4. Of chapter four. As to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information. For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number, they will inform you about the whole situation here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you greetings, and also Barnabas' cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And also Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they have proved to be an encouragement to me. Epaphras who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis, Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings and also Demas. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that is in her house. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Say to Archippus... Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Literally, that is, remember my chains. Grace be with you. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's pray. The speech that King Henry V gave before the Battle of Agincourt is one of the best known passages in any of Shakespeare's plays. People who may not be familiar with Shakespeare are familiar with those lines, especially where Henry calls his troops, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. A person, man or woman, is blessed who has around him or her a band of brothers or sisters. Paul had that. He and his friends were fighting together in the common cause for the kingdom of God. And here in the final verses of the book of Colossians, he mentions them by name. They were faithful friends who helped him with his needs. He was chained in a Roman prison, restricted in his movement. But they could go to churches for him, represent him, and assist him in his ministry. The passage has rightly been called an honor roll of Christian workers. They were faithful friends and true brothers all the result of 
Christ being in them, the mystery that Paul spoke of back in chapter 1 and verse 27. The first one that Paul mentions is Tychicus. He was Paul's messenger, the man who brought the letter to the Colossian church. He would give them information about Paul's imprisonment. We know from Acts chapter 20 and verse 4 that he was from the province of Asia, probably a Gentile, and had a long association with the Apostle Paul. He was with him on his third missionary journey and uh, traveled with him to Jerusalem when Paul took the collection from the Greek churches to the poor Jewish Christians there. Paul sent him on other missions as well. One was to Ephesus and possibly he went to Crete to relieve Titus. He was a trusted friend and collaborator in the ministry. Paul calls him a beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant. Sort of piles up the descriptions there to give a high praise to this man Tychicus. He'd been through the battles with the apostle. And in so doing, he proved to be good and loyal. Along with him, Paul sent Onesimus, who is described as our faithful and beloved brother. There's some beautiful irony in this description intended to underscore God's sovereign grace. Onesimus means useful. But earlier in his life, he had been neither useful nor faithful, just the opposite. He was the slave of Philemon, in whose house the church of Colossae met. But he fled Colossae, and he escaped to Rome, where he had hoped to lose himself in the great city. But there, in the providence of God, he came in contact with Paul, the prisoner, and was converted. Paul speaks of this in his letter to Philemon where he strongly pleads for mercy to be shown to his new child in the faith. He told Philemon to receive him back no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. What a brilliant and compassionate verse. Christ in you makes a great and glorious change from a slave to a brother, from faithless to faithful, from useless to truly useful. A slave and the master are equals. Obviously, Philemon responded well, received Onesimus back as a brother and allowed him to be used of the Lord in service to Paul and the church, and we have good reason to think, gave him his freedom. In verses 10 through 14, Paul sends greetings to the church from six more of his companions. Three are probably Jewish, Aristarchus, Mark, and Jesus, who is called Justice. The second three are probably Gentiles, Epaphras, Luke, and Demas. Warren Wearsby classified these men in three groups, the men who stayed, the man who prayed, and the man who strayed. Aristarchus is a man who stayed, and he can be described as a true and loyal friend. He is found in Acts chapters 19 and 20. And in chapter 20, it stated that he was a native of Thessalonica. He was probably converted there through Paul's ministry, and, and from there he accompanied Paul on many of his travels, in which he was exposed to many of the dangers that the Apostle Paul faced. He was with him in Ephesus when the riot broke out and was even caught up in the violence of it when the mob dragged him into the theater where they staged their protest against Paul. Later, he went to Jerusalem with the apostle and sailed with him from Caesarea to Rome. So he went through the storm at sea and the shipwreck that are described in Acts 27. 
Paul identifies him as my fellow prisoner, which literally means my fellow prisoner of war. And while that is not literal, it's not far from it. They were together in violent, life-threatening circumstances. And he volunteered, volunteered to be there with Paul in all of those circumstances, volunteered to be with him there in his imprisonment to serve the gospel. They were involved in a spiritual war that was every bit as life-threatening as a conventional war. He didn't desert Paul. Paul and Aristarchus were fellow warriors, brothers in arms. Mark is one of the most interesting and happy names listed here because years earlier he did desert Paul. He was on the first missionary journey. It was hard. All of those missionary journeys were very hard. But it was too difficult for Mark and he gave up and went home. He was young, he was immature, his cousin Barnabas wanted to give him an opportunity to redeem himself when he and Paul planned a second missionary journey, but Paul refused. He couldn't risk it. Paul was right. Mark wasn't ready. So Barnabas took him home to Cyprus, took him under his wing, gave him guidance and encouragement, and Mark grew up. Mark wrote the second gospel, the gospel of Mark, and was reunited with Paul. Later, at the end of 2 Timothy, during a second Roman imprisonment, he called for Mark. Bring Mark, for he is useful to me for service. Great words. God uses our terrible failures Failures that affect others to change us, to mature us, and make us useful, useful, useful for service. The third companion who sent greetings is Jesus, named Justice. Nothing is known of him other than his name, but we can infer from his name that he was Jewish and He's in this list of those from the circumcision. So at some point, he made a life-changing choice to trust in Christ. Follow him and be cut off from his family and nation. That, that's a reasonable assumption. He very likely lost much for the gospel. But... He had gained much, gained much more than he had lost. His name is listed in the Bible. He's one of, he's not one of the countless forgotten names of history. He's honored here, honored in his generation, honored now as we read this text. He had the privilege of ministering with Paul and to Paul. Paul speaks of how he and Aristarchus were an encouragement to him. And weary warriors in the spiritual battle do need encouragement. He's described by Paul as a worker for the kingdom of God. Paul usually means the future glorious kingdom, the millennial kingdom, when he speaks of the kingdom of God. For example, after he was stoned in Lystra on that first missionary journey uh, from which Mark departed, he told the saints in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. That's the future kingdom. Living for it involves hardship. Hardship in the present. But living for it is an investment that has treasures and payoffs and dividends that are eternal, that never fade. And justice devoted his life to that. He suffered with Paul, helped Paul, encouraged Paul. He, he may have had scars like Paul had, but knew that he suffered nothing and lost nothing in this life that would not be more than made up for by Christ in the kingdom to come. 
In verse 12, Paul sends greetings from the Gentile Christians, and the first listed is Epaphras. He was a native of Colossae and an evangelist. He brought the gospel to them. He was also a prayer warrior. That naturally goes with evangelism. I think really it naturally goes with any gift that we have, whether it's evangelism or teaching or helps or encouragement or faith or whatever. We pray. We pray that God will bless us in whatever we do and whatever the ministry is that uh, we have received from Him. But certainly in evangelism, one prays that God will prepare the way. God will open hearts to receive the gospel. It's so important that uh, we put prayer into our evangelism. And so it go, it, it's very natural that, that this man, Epaphras, would have been a man of prayer. And Paul wrote of him that he was always laboring earnestly for them in his prayers. Laboring earnestly is the word from which we get our word agony. And so it's quite descriptive. He was always agonizing for them, wrestling in prayer for them, fighting for them before the throne of grace. That's a great man. It may seem like an easy thing to be a person who prays. What's, what's involved? You just, just bow and talk to God. Well, it's just the opposite. Uh, that's where so much of the spiritual battle is fought. Trying to talk to God. Trying to talk to the God of the universe. And because that is where so much of the battle is fought, Satan works hard to keep us out of prayer. We considered this very thing last week. Prayer is one of the most difficult things in the Christian life. It's hard to be consistent in that. So many things distract us. I'll get to that later. And I'll do that this evening. Next thing you know, we've fallen asleep. It's difficult. Difficult to be consistent. Epaphras, Epaphras rather, was. What a, a good brother for Paul to have around him there in Rome. A man of serious, diligent prayer. Epaphras knew the importance of it that it is God's means of grace for getting the blessings and promises that He has given to us. You often hear that question, uh, whether it be uh, the same question is asked of evangelism, but the question is asked at least to someone like me who believes in the absolute sovereignty of God. If God is sovereign, if things are predestined, why pray? Predestined, isn't it? Well, the answer to that is not original with me, but it's a good answer. The God who ordained the end ordained the means to the end. And the means to gaining the blessings that He has preordained for us in His sovereignty is prayer. And if you don't pray, you won't get blessings. It's those who pray, who seek, that find and receive. And this was, no wonder the devil is keeping us out of prayer, keeping us off our, off our knees. Epaphras knew that, and he was diligent in it. And not only was he diligent in prayer, Paul spoke of him in verse 13 as having a deep concern for them. He was emotionally involved in his concern for them. He loved these people. He knew these people. He understood better than anyone the situation in Colossae and the danger posed by these false teachers there. So even though he was away in Rome, he could fight the battle with them through prayer. He's hundreds of miles away, and yet through his prayers, he was right there with them battling. And he was doing so with deep concern because he loved those people. It's an important part of prayer, I think. Loving someone. If you love someone, you're going to pray for them. And I think the more you pray for people you don't really even know, you'll come to love them through the time you invest in prayer for them. Well, what he prayed for his friends in Colossae and also those in the neighboring towns of Laodicea and, Laodicea and Hierapolis where he also brought the gospel 
What he prayed was that they all might stand perfectly and fully assured in all the will of God. We must stand. We are responsible to do that. It takes knowledge and effort to stand. It takes an act of the mind, the intellect, and the will. But grammatically, this is a passive verb, which indicates what is done to us rather than what we do. It's, we are acted upon in a passive verb rather than acting. And what it indicates here is that our standing ultimately is God's work. We're to do it. We must understand the importance of it and act in faith, but ultimately God causes us to stand. We can do it because He enables us. That's the reason we pray to Him. He gives the strength. Therefore, stand. This is what soldiers do. They stand their ground in battle. This is the same word Paul used in Ephesians 6 verse 14 where he speaks of the Christian's armor and tells them, stand firm. Epaphras' prayer was that his friends would stand perfect and fully assured. That is, complete in their knowledge and firm in their assurance. That is so important. There's no standing firm, no effective effort in the Christian life if there is confusion and doubt. There's no spiritual growth when the Christian life is frustrated with doubt. He was praying that they would stay firm in their faith in the gospel as they had when they first heard it. Be convinced of the truth, grow in maturity, and fight the good fight of faith against those who were challenging the faith, trying to corrupt the faith. Christians need to know what they believe and be convinced of it if they're going to do that. They must understand the Christian faith, the doctrines of the Christian faith. They must understand the very thing that Paul was teaching here, the person and work of Christ, the the deity and humanity of Christ, the theanthropic person, the second person of the Godhead, and what He has done that is absolutely sufficient and complete. We need to understand that and know that and believe it firmly. If we're going to fight the good fight, if we're going to do the things that Paul would have us to do, to stand firm, well, To have that assurance and to have that knowledge, there must be reading of the Scriptures. There must be a study of the Scriptures. It's a simple formula that Paul gives and that I've quoted often, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, for how we have a mature faith, how we grow in faith. I think every one of us, if we're believers in Christ, we want to mature. How do we do that? How do we grow? How do I have a stronger faith? Well, Paul puts it very simply, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of Christ. Do you want to have a strong faith? Do you want to grow as a Christian? Do you want to have assurance in your faith? Read the Bible. Study the Bible. Know the Word of God. That's it. That's what nourishes the soul. That's what the Spirit of God uses to strengthen us in our knowledge, our faith, and give us wisdom and standing. So this is what God wants all of us to do. He wants us to stand firm, to stand perfect and fully assured. Now, do you think God will give you the knowledge and strength to stand if you seek it from Him? This is what Epaphras prayed for. If you pray for that, do you think He's going to give that to you? Of course He will. He will not deny us any good thing we need. And we need to know Him better, to stand firm and fight the good fight of faith. So seek it. Seek it for yourself. And like Epaphras, seek it for others. Pray for others. He prayed for his friends. You and I need to pray for one another for this very thing. We have a 
a perfect knowledge. That is a complete knowledge. Know the, the whole range of the Word of God and the doctrines of the Word of God. And stand firm. The other two Gentile converts are, uh, that are mentioned here are Luke and Demas. It's uh, this verse, verse 14, that informs us that Luke was a doctor. Paul calls him the beloved physician. And Paul was blessed to have him near. When you consider all of the beatings and stonings Paul experienced, you can imagine the suffering that he had. The, it must have been chronic pain all of his life. He, he describes these things uh, in, in 2 Corinthians 11, uh, the, the difficulties that he had and, and all of the, the rough places he traveled over mountains and across seas and all of that that must have taken a toll on him physically. And then in addition to that, he speaks in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians of this mysterious thorn in the flesh. It was a, a, an angry affliction that he had continually. God's grace was sufficient for him. That's what he says. My grace is sufficient for you. The Lord assured him in prayer. But he also blessed the apostle with Brother Luke, a beloved physician who could look after him. And Paul certainly needed a physician. Uh, what a fascinating man Luke was. A medical doctor, a true scholar, a genuine historian. His gospel and the book of Acts, which make up so much of the New Testament, were carefully researched. That's how he introduces both of those books. He was a gifted, brilliant man who sacrificed a career that would have been lucrative for him in order to assist Paul. We know from 2 Timothy 4, verse 11, that he was with him to the end. In fact, he wrote to Timothy, only Luke is with me. Now, that's a true brother. In fact, he was the friend of Proverbs 18, verse 24, that sticks closer than a brother. Unfortunately, Demas was different. Every war has its casualties, and Demas was one. In 2 Timothy 4, 10, in Paul's final letter, he wrote the tragic words, Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. What happened? Was this apostasy? Did Demas deny the faith and show that he never was a believer to begin with? I don't think so. In Philemon 24, Paul identified him as a fellow worker. Now, Paul didn't just write that and mistakenly write it. That, those words are inspired by the Holy Spirit. That was put within his mind by the Spirit of God. He was a fellow worker, genuine fellow worker. But he did what Mark had done when he left Paul and Barnabas to return to Jerusalem. Mark recovered from his failure. Maybe Demas did also. We don't know. He disappears from the New Testament. His end, though, reminds us that the path of the Christian is lined with pitfalls. John warned of those, do not love the world nor the things of the world. John gave that warning to Christians because the world is attractive and it has a strong appeal, even to Christians, even to those who are born again, who have a new heart with new inclinations. The, the appeal of the world is very, very strong. And Christians often succumb to the temptation and are carried away by it. It's all part of the spiritual warfare we are in. It's not always persecution that we face. Often, maybe even more than often, it is seduction with promises of pleasure or reward now. We don't have to wait till tomorrow. We don't have to wait till the millennial kingdom. We can fulfill our desires today. Just take it. Eat the fruit. That is a temptation. 
but it's wrong and foolish. As John goes on to say, the world is passing away and also its lusts, which is to say whatever we get, we can't keep. It's temporary. It's passing. The way he puts that is this world that is so alluring, that's so attractive, it's, it's passing away as you look at it. It fades quickly. Well, what captured Demas isn't told. Maybe he went back to Thessalonica because he missed the comforts of home. Or perhaps he was embarrassed by Paul's chains. Whatever it was, it cost him blessing and honor and left him on a sea of regret. It will us too. Demas was doing well when Paul wrote to the Colossians. Maybe you're doing well too as you hear this read. Stay vigilant. Stand firm. Devote yourself to prayer, keeping alert in it. We are always to be on the alert. Demas let down in some way and was carried away. Now in verse 15, Paul returns to some other matters and asks the Colossians to give his greeting to the Christians in Laodicea, which was a city 10 miles west of Colossae. His greeting was to Nympha and the church that is in her house. That's interesting for the background that it gives on the early church. The local churches met in homes. They were house churches. The church in Colossae, as mentioned earlier, met in Philemon's house. The church of Philippi probably met in Lydia's house. In Corinth, it met in the house of Gaius. Wherever Priscilla and Aquila went, they opened their house to the church. Now, I don't take that as a precedent for the modern church. There are advantages to having a building like this. Uh, What it suggests to me, though, is the simplicity of the early church. Uh, You couldn't get very elaborate within a small house. Things were simple. And I think that's very significant for us to know, to understand, because there's value in that. It's not the building that is important. This is a wonderful thing to have, and it should be kept up, and it, it... It is, I think, a witness, a testimony to our our diligence in the faith, the way we keep things up. And it is, as I say, a blessing to have. But what is really important is what goes on within the building. And that is the teaching of the Word of God and obedience to it. That's what really characterized the early church. They received a letter, they read it, they studied it, they talked about it, they sang hymns. Their worship was very simple. It was biblical worship. That's what we need to practice. Paul then instructs the Colossians to pass on his letter to them, to the Laodiceans, after they had read it publicly, while they could expect to receive a letter from the Laodiceans. That uh, statement in verse 16 Read my letter that is coming from Laodicea has caused a lot of speculation about what that letter is. Uh, We don't have a letter to the Laodiceans. We're missing the book of Laodiceans. Was it lost? Well, that's the question. I think the best suggestion, the best answer to that, at least to my mind, is that Paul was referring to the epistle to the Ephesians Many feel the book of Ephesians was a circular letter that it it was sent to uh, all of the churches in that region, so it was sent on a circuit, and it was at Laodicea and would soon be coming to Colossae. So the idea is when the Laodiceans finish reading and studying the book of Ephesians, they would send it on to Colossae, and those in Colossae were to be looking for it, to be expecting it. In verse 17, Paul gives a special message to Archippus, a man of some position and authority 
in the church. Paul also greeted him in Philemon 2. He wrote here, Say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Now reading that in the context of this letter and the problems in the church, it's not hard to imagine that Paul knew that Archippus was tired and discouraged from the battles with the heretics. And so he wrote this to encourage him to keep at it. He needed to be reminded of this. He needed to be reminded that this is not some ministry that Archippus had taken on himself and could just quit whenever he felt like it. The Lord had given this ministry to him. He had received it. This was both a great blessing and great responsibility. One he would give an account of to the Lord. He had no choice but to continue in it and go forward for Christ and the gospel. So he says, fulfill it. It's a little bit like saying, play the man, do it. The work is not yet finished, finish it. And he can do that, Archippus can do that because he has the Lord who is sufficient for all the challenges that we face. In chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, Paul said that all the fullness of deity dwells in Christ. And in Him we have, we have been made complete, or literally been made full. In other words, we have Christ and He is sufficient. We need nothing more. So here it seems... Paul was using this word fulfill to remind Archippus of who he is and what he has as a Christian, that he's literally full and he can fulfill what he is to do because Christ has made him full and complete. That's true for all of us. Christ is sufficient. He's made us full. He's equipped us completely. We're to act upon that. And that's the book of Colossians, really. That's the, the subject of it, the sufficiency of Christ. We are in Him and He is in us. We can do all that He has called us to do, not in our own strength. We certainly can't do anything in our own strength, but in His we can. In Him, as Paul said back in chapter 2, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And yet, still, we need one another in all of this. Paul didn't minister alone. You never see Paul out there on the mission field all by himself. He was surrounded by brothers. They were a great help to him. Fellow prisoners and fellow workers, he called them. It's in this way, at least in part, that the sufficiency of Christ's life is communicated to us. And it's as we bear each other's burdens that we're able to give through us the life and sufficiency of Christ, at least in part. And as we do that, we strengthen the hands that are weak. We bear the burdens of each other. This is what we're to be doing. You see how important brothers and sisters were to the apostle. They're no less important to us. We cut ourselves off from so much of what the Lord gives by not joining with fellow believers in worship and service. One of the greatest gifts that God gives to each one of us is a good friend. Be that. Be that to others. The letter ends with Paul's signature. He normally dictated his letters and then, and then at the end would, would take up the pen himself and uh, put his personal signature on them. And here, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Paul's signature was distinctive and well-known. He, for example, says to the Galatians at the end of the book in 
Galatians 6, 11, see with what large letters I write. Uh, evidently, that was the distinctive aspect of his signature. Something about it was very distinctive, and, and that signature was proof that the letter they received was genuine. And so it gave the stamp of apostolic authority to the letters. Paul then makes a request and gives a benediction. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. Literally, it is remember my chains. What a picture that gives of the great apostle laboriously writing his name with a heavy chain on his hand. The apostle of the heart set free, as F.F. F. Bruce called him, in chains. And yet he was free, the freest man in Rome. Christ had given him freedom, freedom from the penalty of sin, freedom from the power of sin, and Christ was in him. And he is in every believer, and being in every believer, he is the hope of glory. He's the certainty that we will enter into that glory to come. That's why Paul could end as he did, not with chains, but with grace be with you. It was with him, even in those chains. Christ was with him and would never forsake him. And in his sovereign grace, the Lord had blessed Paul with friends and blessed them with the privilege of ministering with Paul and ministering to Paul. Is there a greater honor role in all of the world than this one? For 2,000 years, these names have been read by Christians and remembered in churches for the sacrifice and service they represent. In Shakespeare's speech, King Henry told his soldiers that in years to come, men among them would tear their sleeves to show the scars they got at Agincourt, while gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here. We could think ourselves accursed for not being there in Rome with the apostle at his side as he wore those chains, but... That would be wrong. We have the opportunity now to join the same battle. We have the same opportunity now to serve Christ, to further the kingdom of God, and have our names mentioned with those listed here when Christ returns with His reward. Then He'll call us His band of brothers. And then... Whatever scars we got in the spiritual battles we fought will become glorious badges of honor. What a day that will be. It's coming. Maybe soon. But even now, the author of Hebrews tells us, the Lord Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call us His brothers. The reason is, He made us saints. He made us a new creation through His sufferings and death. Saints are soldiers. How are you soldiering? How am I soldiering? It's a question we must ask ourselves because the pull of the world is strong. The desire for ease is great. The longing to avoid embarrassment from the gospel pulls at us. May God make us all, every believer here, to stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God, a real band of brothers to one another and to Christ our Savior. He is the Savior, the only Savior. Is He your Savior? Have you believed in Him? It's all one must do. It's all one can do. He did all that was necessary for salvation on the cross when He suffered the penalty of our sin in our place. Nothing we can add to it. No extra formulas that some teacher can come along and share with us that we need. No extra ceremony. Simply trust in Christ. 
Faith is the open hand that receives the gift. If you've not believed, open the hand of your heart and receive the blessing of life, the blessing of forgiveness that is in Jesus Christ. Look to Him. He receives all who do, fully forgives them, and gives them life everlasting. And then by His grace and power, live for Him, stand like a soldier in all of the will of God. May God help us all to do that. It's a great book. I'm glad we went through it. I enjoyed it. I hope you did. Why don't we end with a great hymn, one of the modern hymns, a hymn in the Songs of Praise book, hymn number 35, O Church Arise, Arise to sing and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 35, in Christ we have, and with Christ in us, we have the hope of glory, and someday we will stand in that glory. In the meantime, Father, as we are here in this battlefield of the world, we pray that you would make us to stand in your will and stand strong. Give us the desire to do that and in your grace enable us to do that. We thank you for Christ who is sufficient for all things and it's in his name we pray. Amen.